Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, speaking to you from the Miami Herbert Business School. This is John Quelch here, the uh, Dean of the School. And welcome to this very special event with uh, Professor Mike Beer from Harvard Business School. Uh, I'm gonna briefly introduce uh, Mike and then hand over to uh, one of my colleagues, Cecily Cooper uh, from our management department. Uh, this is really a, a wonderful event that has been organized Organized uh, by our management department within the business school. And uh, I'm really only here just to introduce my former colleague at Harvard Business School, uh, Mike Beer, who was the Karnas Rab, or is, I should say, the Karnas Rab Professor of Business Administration uh, Emeritus and uh, co founder and director of uh, TruePoint Partners, a management consultancy, and also of the Center for uh, Higher Ambition Leadership. Uh, which is a nonprofit CEO membership organization uh, dedicated to helping CEOs uh, compete and do good. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Mike. Uh, just, just to say that Mike is a very distinguished uh, scholar who was at HBS when I arrived and is still at HBS long after I've gone. And that gives you some sense of the longevity of his, uh, of his contributions in this important area of leadership and uh, human resource management. Um, Cecily Cooper is an associate professor in our management department, uh, an expert on uh, trust among other uh, scholarly endeavors. And uh, she will conduct the, uh, the Q&A session with Mike uh, after he uh, makes his presentation. Mike, uh, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, thank you, John. It's a, a pleasure and appreciate the invitation to do this. I, I, hello to everybody uh, on this, uh, uh, this uh, Zoom meeting, uh, Zoom presentation, webinar. Uh, I'm very glad to be with you. Um, and I'm very, very glad uh, and thank the University of Miami and uh, the Herbert Business School for inviting me. Let me get started. Um, uh, this is obviously a cover to my book, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what it's aimed to do uh, and what problem it is trying to solve. Uh, it, corporations uh, are now facing more change than they have ever faced before. Changes in the competitive markets, changes in uh, technology, and most importantly, has come to the fore more recently, particularly changes in social norms and expectations of what business should be doing and how it should be doing it. Uh, and that is an ever increasing cycle. That's one trend. And we, we know from other research that's been done, Edelman's survey on trust the trust is at a very low point and regard for all the institutions from corporations to government uh, to uh, not-for-profits to NGOs are low and have not been, have, have been low for a long time. And uh, at some point recently have actually hit some kind of a, an index point on Edelman's survey that says we got big troubles. Uh, and uh, the question is, why does this trust, what, not only why does this trust, the lack of trust exist and a lack of commitment, uh, but what is its effect and how can it be turned around? Well, let me start, first of all, by articulating a basic principle. Organizations, whoops, I'm having trouble moving, there we go. You can think of organizations much as you think of icebergs. Uh, about 80 to 90% of the iceberg sticks above water. The rest of it is underwater. And boats and ships like corporations who navigate without knowing what is underwater are in trouble. Uh, I call this the organizational iceberg. And the main reason that 
they hit icebergs regularly. That is, in a minute, I'll show you how and why in more detail. That is, they fail to really achieve uh, the highest potential level of performance, the highest level of trust, the highest level of commitment necessary for change to really occur on an ongoing basis is organization silence. That is the inability of truth to speak to power. But I elaborate, this is not just about speaking to power, but having, an, uh, having senior management's inability to have an honest collective, meaning with enough of the organization involved uh, and public, internally public, that is that everyone knows the conversation is going on about how we are functioning and how we're doing. Our trust, our leadership, our commitment, our structure, our processes, whatever might be going on in the organization. There is a lack of that kind of communication. And instead, uh, we have more command and control approaches to change that ultimately do not succeed and certainly are not sustainable. So uh, let me uh, continue. So the argument then is strategic transformations, which have to go on at an ever faster pace. By strategic, I mean not just about business, but also about the purpose of the organization, its values and its uh, contribution to society is hard and too often fails. Why? If you think about a transformation, I would argue that it has to balance the left side and the right side here in this, in this model. Uh, on the left side, you see what most often happens in transformations. They deal with symptoms. That is, they are short-term. We have a problem. Let's create an initiative, a program or some kind to fix the problem. They focus on the hard stuff, so the short-term, as opposed to long-term perspective. Let's not just fix the short-term problem. We need to do that for sure, or we're gonna go down with the boat right now, or, What's the long-term purpose? What is our long-term aspiration for strategic success? What is our long-term view of the values and culture we wanna create in this organization, particularly with regard to things like trust and commitment and collaboration and partnership? They tend to focus on the hard stuff, the easy stuff to see that's tangible, uh, that's uh, palpable, uh, the structure, the processes, the particular mechanisms we do things, technical mechanisms, including even policies and practices in HR that are written, but not necessarily enacted. That is on the soft stuff, okay? The real stuff that occurs in organizations is, is understood in the experience of people in the organization. They know what's going on. They know why things work well and what they like. They also know what doesn't work very well, and I will elaborate on this. Uh, and and uh, but the stuff is inaccessible. It's intangible and inaccessible because there's no way to reveal it. All of the iceberg. And organizational transformations tend to be on the surface, with the palpable, with the tangible, as opposed to deep, with issues of assumptions mindsets and leadership behavior, which often is underlying a lot and, and leadership, not just leadership behavior of the individual, but the way the leadership function is organizing, managing the enterprise. I call that deep. So what, why does this occur? It occurs one on the left side because people, leaders in general, this is a human condition. Uh, doesn't exempt anybody, including myself, uh, basically are uncomfortable with going to the right side because the right side reveals uncomfortable things. It reveals some potentially threatening things. And just the idea of even approaching them somehow threatens the desire of the leader to be in control. So, and when they have short-term pressure from the outside, short-term quarterly earnings, which tends to be 
incorporate true incorporations or in government and NGOs. Let's get this done. We got to move faster. We have to do something. They go to the left hand side. So that's the go to position under pressure. On the right side, uh, it takes that longer term perspective. It takes some way to stop for a minute to see what is really going on in this organization. How do we fix the underlying problems so we don't have to keep fixing them all over again? And that kind of transformation to stay on the right side of this, to be on the right side while also paying attention to the left side. I'm not arguing the right is the only thing. I'm arguing that we need to find out what the short-term problems are so we don't the boat doesn't go down right away. But we also need to focus on the long-term to ensure that our boat can navigate uh, the terrain that we're in, in the, the ocean we're in in the long term. So transformations require step out courage. So this is a lot about the courage for leaders to have an honest conversation, which means they're gonna learn some things that they may not necessarily be comfortable with about their system of organizing, managing and leading. And I wanna emphasize the system of organizing. There is not, the reason the left doesn't work is because organizations are multifaceted. There are many factors that affect their success. So how do we get a balance between the left and right hand side? We had to invent a way to do that because it's hard to do and it doesn't happen often enough. And it all started with Ray Gil Martin, who in 1990 uh, was the CEO of Beckton Dickinson, really about to take over as CEO in the process of taking over. And he came to me and he said, Mike, we have great strategy. Uh, and uh, we know it's it, they, uh, they had every reason to believe that because they were all former strategists in a large consulting firms that migrated to Beckton Dickinson. Uh, Gil Martin himself was a strategy consultant who be, went in and became CEO, worked on strategy and became the CEO. And he said, we can't execute our current strategy of transferring products from the US to, to uh, uh, Europe and other places because the country organizations just keep doing what they wanna do. They're not really willing to listen to the business unit manager. So they were an organizational set of dynamics going on. I knew that that was probably the problem, but I didn't know the specifics. And the problem was we had to understand, he had to understand, he and his team had to understand the specifics. So we had created this process, which we call the strategic fitness process, which is a process for honest collective and public conversations that are really training wheels, if you will, or, or structured processes, structures and ground rules that enable an honest conversation so that senior management can take action, diagnose, take action, and communicate to the organization as a whole that what, they, what they're going to do in a way that is believable and then actually do it and tell the organization what they did and why. Uh, and so it starts with the senior team defining a direction, a purpose, a strategy, a set of values, a culture, their desire for collaboration or whatever they might want to be, that's, that, that's a direction. The appointment of a task force, which then connects to the larger organization in an inquiry that then essentially uh, moves up the organization. That's the advocacy. They carry the direction to the organization based on a two or three page statement. And they go come back with their inquiry. Senior management then has to deliberate, diagnose, decide on an action plan, and again, advocate, and then ask, is this at, is what we're trying to do the right thing? Inquire about that, make adjustments and act, and then go back through the process again. Let's find out how it's working. It's, it's that kind of an action learning process. And with I'm not gonna go into the details of this. I will tell you, obviously the challenge is how do you get a task force of eight people to really speak up. Well, we had to invent a way. Uh, first of all, them going out and interviewing confidentially, but at the same time, developing a set of themes that they go back to the uh, senior team with and, uh, and uh, 
describe and discuss in a in a way that's understandable that is not a PowerPoint, but really just here are the five or six or seven themes. And here's what the truth is. Here's some examples. Here's what people said. Not in the, no identification of individuals, but this is what's going on in the organization. Um, and we just decided, we started with PowerPoints. It didn't work. So we basically created this fishbowl. The task force spends a day analyzing their data rigorously. They get some help with that. And then the senior team sits around the outer U. They come in. Here is a list of things. Let's talk among ourselves around each theme for 30 minutes, just or whatever the length of time seems appropriate to basically ex explain and tell the senior team to uh, uh, understand what's going on. The senior team has gr their ground rules. The task force can't blame. They can only describe. The senior team can must listen. They can't, they can't say it's not true. Uh, the first time we did this, somebody, the senior manager said, the perceptions are not fact, are not true. That's not right. Well, no perceptions in this case of fact. So just to be sure, the senior management that decides to go into this is immediately increasing trust in the organization because they're making themselves vulnerable by saying, tell me the truth. It includes me as well, by the way. So that has to be clearly articulated uh, uh, right at the start and is by leaders who want to lead in this particular way. So obviously, there are many implications for leadership here. Leadership has to be humble. It has to be accepting of what of lower levels views. It has to work collaboratively in a partnership with lower levels. That's a whole shift in mindset about leadership. Well, what did we find when we analyzed task force after task force after task force, what they said? Uh, we, we heard a lot of stuff, but we said, let's go take two dozen task forces. First dozen were at Beckton Dickinson. The second dozen were across many different companies of different sizes in different industries. So this is not, what I'm about to tell you is not industry specific. It is not even specific to companies because we have found it in not-for-profits. Uh, I had, had took a walk with a woman who was just take, uh, entered, had just been with a not-for-profit for maybe about uh, two years and she loved the job and the work but I started talking, she learned that I was an organizational behavior specialist. And, and we talked about the work I do. And I mentioned these silent killers. And she said, oh, my God, I got every one of these. And this is basically what I've heard in many, many places. But we, our analysis says that that is true. So what do task forces tell us? Again, I can't go into a lot of detail, but here's the over, overview. All of uh, the task forces come in 10 out of 10 times when they're interviewed and told what the strategy and direction and values are. This is what they say. It was unclear. Uh, we were unclear about the strategy. We're not clear about the values. We have conflicting priorities. Pe different parts of the organization are trying to do different things. And uh, that's one of the problems that's blocking our ability to execute, to, go, to implement even our best intentions. Uh, I might add, by the way, before I go further, the task force also is asked to come in, what are the strengths of this organization? That's how the conversation starts. So they are strengths and they need to be preserved. And the senior management hears them first. Secondly, the task force comes in 10 out of 10 times. We do not, you, you as a senior team are not effective. It's said in different ways. Sometimes it's said very directly and sometimes it is pretty obvious as they talk about these issues. Uh, and what they mean is not that you individually are not effective. Uh, that can also be true in some very rare cases. In most cases, it's how the team works. It's not working effectively. It's not developing its own, pro it, does not, it does not speak with one voice to the rest of the organization because they themselves in some way have not created a common voice. The leader is always to some extent 
embedded in the task in the in the um, in the um, feedback, and uh, it usually is some some kind of signal that they, either things are happening too top down, or there's not enough leadership, not enough engaging the organization in critical issues. As one uh, uh, leader said, we were told that we got to lead and we haven't been, okay? Uh, there is always a lot of stuff about coordination. This is a 10 out of 10. We, we do not have the right integration in this organization between functions, businesses, geography, depending on the size of the organization, a small organization, it just functions and activities uh, and uh, that are in a small, much smaller scale. But in large corporate structures, we have three dimensional organizations. The problem is a multiple function and often embedded in the fact that their matrix organizations, whatever version they have is not working effectively. Uh, and the collaboration is breaking down and if they, they either don't have the right mechanisms or uh, like task forces, project teams, business teams, or they're not functioning right. And so there's a problem of design here that really is, there's an adequacy in clarifying the roles, responsibilities, relationships across different activities and how to pull them together. In just about, this is not 10 out of 10, but about eight to not eight to eight out of 10 in, say we have inadequate management and leadership development and we therefore have inadequate down the line leaders and uh, this shows up in a lot of different ways uh, we found out actually when you develop an action plan often you need to find leaders to lead teams and stuff like that. they don't have them uh, but the task force identifies that obviously because it affects the people they talk to who want more development in a, but they're not getting it uh, and the last one is a low capacity for honest conversations. Every one of them, people who are interviewed, first of all, say, I have known about some of these things for some time, but this is the first time I've been really asked about it. Yes, we've had surveys, but this time I'm in a conversation. That is, I feel like I'm talking to you. You're going to carry the message to senior management, and I'm going to hear back what they're going to say, because that's what the organization is told. This process is announced in advance, so everybody knows that it's going on. And, uh, uh, and, and so uh, that's, that is the critical factor that, as you will see in a minute, locks these things into a single uh, syndrome. It's a syndrome. Now, I'd like a survey now, if I could, of how many of you actually on a seven, uh, one to seven scale, uh, to what extent do you see each of these particular silent killers? So go through the silent killers one through six and say to a great extent, somewhat, not at all. Uh, can we have that survey now, please? Just in the organization you're working in now or in a previous organization you worked in, if you are not in an organization now, if you're doing something else. Yeah, the, the attendees can view the poll now. So they're answering it. I see them answering. Yeah. And I'll wait for you to tell me when the survey is done. Okay, we'll give, give folks a little bit more time. I can see how many people are answering the questions. just another minute or so. I see there's still a lot of other responses rolling in. Thank you everyone for participating. And this is an anonymous poll, by the way. Yeah, yeah, well, totally anonymous. We've learned that you have to be anonymous to get the truth, so. <laughs> and if you work here at the business school, Dean Quelch cannot see your responses. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, I can't vote either. 
Okay, can we can okay. we give it a yeah. shot? And so I'm going to go ahead and end polling right now so we can continue with the talk. Thank you, Cecilia. And let's see, I'm going to share results. All right. Somewhat on extent of unclear strategy. Uh, somewhat on the extent of an ineffective senior team. Uh, can, let's see, can, does this scroll forward? Okay. Uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat again, uh, on the extent of leadership behavior, top down or laissez faire, 52%, 53%. Uh, on the previous ones, I didn't read the percentage, 67% on unclear strategy. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, none of these surprise me, actually. Um, the extent of poor coordination, 40, again, around 50%. And uh, to what extent inadequate leadership, uh, leadership development around 50% and uh, inadequate uh, in low, low capacity for honest conversations to a great extent, 38%. So more on a great extent and 40%. So the, 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 the net result is a, way, a, a large majority of the people are really seeing the inability to speak truth to power and have this honest conversation. Now, this is completely consistent. Thank you. And I'd love, I'd love to, if you could send me the results of this thing, I'd like, like to see it. But anyway, um, let me close this. Uh, so this is not surprising. This is what happens in most organizations uh, that at least a fairly large number of them have several of these problems together, or at least some of them in particular, depending on their evolutionary state. So uh, what, does this, what does this amount to then? Let me talk about this a briefly because we're running out of, I wanna get into a discussion here. Uh, this is the dynamics of an organization that has these barriers present. They work together to prevent really a, the enactment of the, of the direction that senior management uh, espouses and wants to go to. That's the job of senior management. So senior management can't enact, has a poor quality of direction. The first three barriers really, if you don't have an effective team, they don't sit down and talk about the strategy on an ongoing basis. The leader is too top down or laissez faire, doesn't allow the team to really develop. Those two things go together. They have an unclear strategy that in itself reinforces those three barriers into a poor quality. Nobody agrees on the strategy. They may have some head agreement, but no agreement. If they can't have that, if, if the quality of implementation, getting it done depends on the coordination collaboration. Are we together in working, in working on this? And that is a function of the design of organization. As I said earlier, usually the lack of teams, the lack of ineffective teams, the lack of uh, other mechanisms, information systems, uh, and, and, and information flow that prevents that, and inadequate leaders to really help execute in various units, teams, et cetera. Very, very few leaders to, to really run these kinds of cross activities in an effective way, whatever they may be. There's no predestination. And, and then the inability of lower levels to speak about where we are failing is the closed vertical communication, and that leads to a poor quality of learning. And that's the central idea here, that organizations have to continually learn, and that requires trust and communication and honest communication, which you can't get without trust. Now, I want to emphasize this process in itself does send a very clear message that we trust you to tell us the real truth and we will accept the truth and that in itself sends a message of vulnerability which most leaders are not readily able to do that is a humble leadership which is a rare commodity in leadership to really hear the truth and then really work on it and so that it's not our decision what we're going to do it's the organization's decisions and there's a a hundred people who, inter who are interviewed uh, to the, by a task force. So by definition, at least a hundred or 150, however, are interviewed 
feel like they're part of the process and they're the key people in the organization. And of course, the simple notion that this is going on, we have found just makes, makes this a very attractive process to the organization and one in a number of business units, people started to say, I want to go to work for you because I heard about this. And every task force says the people we talk to 100%, we love this process because it gives them a feeling of effectiveness to be in the, in the game with senior management. Let me quickly say why honest con collective internally public conversations work based on our research. And then I'll turn it over to Sicily to really have a discussion with me and with you. One, it established a partnership between employees and the, and the organization. That partnership is critical to getting everybody to hold hands metaphorically to move into the future, whatever that future is. It provides valuable information. We learn a lot. At Radio Martin, every CEO at Beckton Dickinson, every leader we've dealt with who's gone through this has learned some things about tangible things and intangibles, the undiscussable, the soft elements of the organization, the deeper elements of the organization. And if they continue this, they keep peeling the onion of the organization. Change efforts become more systemic. You're not just addressing the hard issues because in the conversation, softer issues come up. How we communicate, how we lead, et cetera. The silent killers. Egos and politics are suppressed. That's one of the interesting things we found that when the senior team begins to hear this stuff, they say, oh my God, we are accountable. Uh, we are have to fix it collectively. So you, you, the politics start fading away. In one team, the task force came back to the CEO with a letter of resignation until we fix it. You can exercise these letters next year if we don't start fixing some of these problems. Uh, similar kinds of things have happened. Trust and commitment increased dramatically. Uh, people begin to say, oh my God, just the idea that management is asking these questions and we're in a conversation, this is not a survey. They know the task force will directly tell the senior management what collectively they have said. In fact, we asked the task force to go back and call people and tell them the message has been delivered. And the purpose of that is not to talk about what they delivered because they'll hear about that. It's to say, we're still alive. We didn't get killed at the process. A lot of task forces come with a task force, not, with, a, with a button that says, don't kill the messenger. As metaphorically, that's the fear that they have about speaking up. And if you go to talk, if you talk to them the night before over dinner, which we always do, the, the, the palpable, the anxiety is palpable. Uh, transparency, learning and accountability for change increase. Senior management is now accountable to the lower levels. Uh, and lower levels are accountable to senior management because they have been part of the process. And leaders and leadership teams are developed. The leaders and teams that have gone through this do get insight about how to improve their functioning as a leadership team. Leadership is a learned process. It is not something that you inherit. This is a way of learning what it means to lead in this organization around the issues that we have to solve. And what we find is that the hope that real change is going to occur in the organization is rekindled. This to, this will not pass like other initiatives. The fallacy of programmatic change, which I found in other research I've done, is the reason the programmatic change is about the hard stuff, it's not about the soft stuff, is really one of the reasons that pe most people in organizations, actually most people we found in, in this work, we've done this 800 times in different, or more really in different kinds of organizations. They say, I don't think this organization can change. That's their starting position. If this is successful, well, the hope is rekindled. I would just urge last word, one time will help you get something done. Doing it on an ongoing basis in this way or in other ways will continue to build the capacity of the organization to learn and develop. I'm gonna rest my case, Cicely, it's all yours. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Beer. And, um, and at this time, you could consider um, to stop sharing your screen if you'd like, unless you feel that you need to refer back to the slides during q and I'll leave it up to you. you. You want me to get out of the slides? Is that right? Well, if, if you do, then um, then the participants yeah. can see, can okay. see a bit better. Yeah, sure. Okay. And uh, I have a couple of questions for Professor Beer. And while I ask these, I would uh, encourage the audience members, if you have some questions, to submit them in writing. And I'm also going to uh, get to as many of these as we can before our webinar ends at 7 p.m. Okay. So let's see, Professor Bear, I can still see your screen if you can. Oh, oh, uh, what do I need yeah. to do here? I think you go to, um, you go to your um, video icon and you click the up arrow or no, no, I'm sorry. There's a share screen icon at the bottom and, oh. um, and you should be able to click that and stop sharing your screen. Uh, yeah, I don't want them. I, uh, I, where, it's at the, very, at the very bottom, a green button that says. Well, I don't see, I don't have a bottom. That's the okay. problem. Uh, uh, I don't see a bottom. Well, let's see. Polling, Q&A, participants. Uh, okay, here we go. Wonderful. Now we've, now we've got it. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so Professor Beer, uh, my first question, you know, what inspired you to develop this process? In other words, why did you develop it? There are already many models of organizational change out there, different frameworks for organizations to analyze their strategies. You know, you know, what was a, a deficiency or a shortcoming that made you come up with this strategic fitness process? Well, for years I had worked, uh, either first, my first years and at, were actually inside a company uh, at Corning uh, Incorporated years ago. And I was inter an internal researcher and consultant to them on a variety of issues. And of course, I noticed that a lot of people had a lot to say about a lot of things that were going on in the company, but they couldn't really say it. They could say it to me. And when, when leaders came to me, the various, and this is a, an, a common approach uh, of consultants, you know, they will go out and interview people and then feedback the, fi the findings to senior management. Um, and, you know, some, pe some people in companies refer to that, well, consultants will tell you what time it is. Well, yes, because you don't know the time. And, and that kind of experience, uh, for years, that's what I did. I interviewed and fed back. And uh, when Regia Martin came to me, uh, and asked us, we decided to do it in a different way. For one reason, because we were not going to be around forever. We were, I, I was a professor at the Harvard Business School. I couldn't spend 100% of my time. I was going to work for the company. So we had to create a way that would institutionalize the learning process. And that's how the structure came about. And of course we had to figure out how to make the conversation open and mm -hmm. safe. So this yeah. is a safe mm -hmm. conversation for both lower levels and upper levels, because there isn't, so we avoid blaming and defensiveness and emotional outbursts by the structure and the rules that we create, the engagement rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question before we go to the chat. Uh, you know, sure. you mentioned, you, mentioned uh, you know, the importance of these honest collective public conversations and, um, you know, I thought one story that you told was interesting. So the task force comes in and they have buttons on that say, don't kill the messenger. And yeah. trust scholar, you know, we see all the time that organizations really lack trust between managers and employees across levels. And I'm wondering, there has to be a certain degree of trust to even enable this process to get started. Have you ever experienced or worked with an organization where there wasn't enough baseline trust to even do the strategic fitness process? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I would say the big barrier to getting this, but this is not a routine strategic learning. And, and uh, I call this a strategic governance and learning process. Uh, 
and uh, I mean, that's another way to refer to this other than the name of the process itself. And the reason, and what stops it is not the desire is, not, it, it, yes, it is lack of, well, a lack of trust of people to tell the truth, but the real element I find is that people are willing to do it when they feel it's authentic and safe. And so it, the, the reason it's not widely used is because most managers are not ready to do this. This is outside their comfort zone in leadership. They don't, uh, they don't fundamentally uh, act as humble leaders who know that they can't get it all done that they need the, their people, not just the immediate people around them, but that, that's important. That's why senior teams are often not effective, but also the organization to be engaged in the, in the thing. So the, the lack of trust is more of the leaders, the trust that the organization and its people really can help them. I'll tell you one phenomenon that I found in many, many organizations that senior team, once they hear from the task force, uh, they are blown away and they say things like, oh my God, this team acted like the best consultants we've ever had. And they've had many, okay? Mm -hmm. Many who, whom, by the way, don't help that much because the consultants, you know, tell them what is wrong, but it's not embedded in, it's not, a, it, they don't internalize it. And they reject it in many cases when they want to reject it. Uh, and of course, in many cases, they employ consultants for the wrong reasons, because it, it's a way to protect themselves against the board's uh, concern about their performance. Uh, so you, the desire to have an honest conversation by the senior team is the main trust issue. It's a trust in their own people to help them with, uh, with improving things. Yeah, and the process really gives them an opportunity to, to really view the competence and skills and strategic knowledge of their employees. And then that further builds trust um, downwards from management to those employees. Yeah, so very, very, very trust. excellent. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, I'm looking at the questions. Uh, we have a question from Samantha Gonzalez. She asks, for companies that touch multiple regions and countries, at what level is the task force most yeah. effective? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and for that, I have to first tell you how to think about an organization. An organization, a, a large multifaceted corporation, we've done this at Merck, 60,000 employees worldwide and other large corporations. And we've also done it as small units. So. You have to think about the corporation as a set of units. I didn't have that slide. I could have had that slide. So you got the senior unit. That's the senior, uh, the CEO, the senior team, the key heads of key regions and businesses and their staffs. I would say that's the extended leadership team of the corporation. That is a unit. And that is the unit in which the corporation creates this honest conversation if they want it. Now, each of those leaders runs a business, a region, a function, or some other major entity, operations, a factory, down several levels down. Each of those are units also. And each of those leaders needs to go through the process in order to enact improvements and learning in their own organization about how, what we're doing well and what's not working. And uh, so to me, you can start this anywhere, but ideally, of course, you wanna start at the corporate level, but frankly, at Beckton Dickinson and in other companies, we start at the unit level. So Ed Ludwig at, at Beckton Dickinson, I'm using this only as one example, did it as a division manager, found it incredibly useful in taking charge of a new organization. And will tell you it saved his quote unquote, you know what I'm saying, uh, rear, rear and uh, ultimately became the CEO of the company when he applied at the corporate level. So, uh, but, but ideally you want to start. So that's the idea. And if you really want to transform the whole organization, as Peter Dunn said, when he was running a restaurant company, he said, I've got to do this in every restaurant. In fact, one of the chapters in my book, I have a lot of different cases, was in a restaurant. How did this work? 
with a senior team of only three managers, because it's just a restaurant of 60, 70 people, uh, you know, had enacted a way of managing that they didn't really want to enact, but they were caught, leaders themselves are caught in the organization rhythm in a way that's not effective. So they learned a lot about it, but they created trust. They didn't trust to begin with. They didn't even tr initially reacted badly to the feedback until they finally began to grapple with it. Uh, the rules say you got to grapple with it. We also have a facilitator that in the outside cases stops the action and say, we're talking about the problems of the organization and we said we would work on them. Uh, and and that, that made, made a difference. But I have to tell you that the feedback around the fishbowl is relatively unfacilitated. Once this is going, the task force just speaks very freely. They often tell the senior management, we are reporters, so don't shoot us. We're telling you not what we think, mm -hmm. and that, th that adds a lot of credibility. So it's not what we think. It Professor is what Bureau. people are telling us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. We have a few more really good questions that I wanna get to. The, sure, this, go ahead. You mentioned in your book, but I don't know if you mentioned it in your talk. And so John Mazias asks, are these conversations primarily among internal stakeholders? Is it too difficult logistically to include external stakeholders? So he's basically uh, asking whether you include people who are external to the organization. That's great, great question. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, you can. Uh, it was initially designed to do just internal, but on a number of occasions, including at Beckton Dickinson on several occasions, uh, the task force interviews other stakeholders so that you get the voice of other people into it. They talk to analysts on Wall Street. They talk to their thought partners. They talk to their suppliers. They talk to their the business to business customers, which is what they were doing, and brought that information into the into the fishbowl and into the conversation. And management wanted to have that input, so that you can do that. You can do this in different sequences. You can do one of these with customers. First, what do customers think? And you present them with the same. It's the same idea. Here is what we're trying to do, which obviously includes things about the customer. Okay. What do you see as the, in a, the capacity of, of whatever the company is or the business unit is to enact that? You can do that. Obviously, each internal unit has its own customers, right? Uh, you know, a business unit is dependent on functions. Functions have their, their, as, as their customers the business unit. You can do that internally. So an R&D group can ask all parts of the organization they serve, how effectively do we serve them? Uh, and and in the in the company, you can bring those key people from those other units into the conversation when the feedback occurs. So we've done that. We've got ex officio chairs in the in the or in in the senior team to discuss that. You can do that if you really have brave if you're brave and courageous. And that is what that's my last chapter. This is required courage. You bring the cost key bring two or three key customers into the feedback and have them be part of it. And then advertise to the rest of the customers what you've just done and what you've learned and how you're changing it. Uh, you can do that with um, your, your community representatives if, to serve the community. Again, you think about the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders who should be interviewed? Who are, you can't keep every stakeholder yeah. in the conversation. You can, but you can a sample and then advertise have them be your best advertisers for what you're trying to do and so on. Professor Beer, I'm gonna jump in again because we have a big picture question from one of our audience members, Sandy Goldstein, who asks, um, and so Sandy first comments about how in this recent year, there's been a significant shift in how people communicate within organizations. So within organizations, between organizations. And <clears throat> let's see, um, you know, do you feel that um, that employees' desire or management's desires are going to keep these things the same? Are going they going to regress back? Uh, are these changes something that could be sustained, and how? So it's a little outside if I understand of the book. The question, but can this be can this be sustained? Is that is that the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. These new communication practices that we're seeing within and between organizations. 
Well, I think that that's a great question and it's a big problem. I mean, it's a challenge, let's put it this way. And the answer is the organ, our research shows that to the extent that the organization uh, commits to doing this periodically, either at multiple levels uh, or in different ways even, on an ongoing basis, things are sustained. That's again, the short term, remember that first chart, the short term, it's short term, if you do it to solve a problem, and once you solve it, you forget about it, it's done, you never do it again, it's episodic, it doesn't work as well, it doesn't sustain itself. Yet, it, at the same time, trust and commitment do not sustain themselves, because that is really what is the deeper elements that you're changing, you're changing the nature of the relationship between senior management and lower levels in terms of partnerships, that is not sustained unless you continue the process either formally or informally. My argument is formally because it's too hard to do and sustain over time. So you need this institutionalized. That's the long-term argument. But whatever you do, this is kind of learning process at most levels is critical. Okay. And um, okay, Professor Beer, this next question is about leadership development. It's about developing talent. And uh, Dean Myers asks, how can leadership deal with the job of building the best talent and to get results and so many other inputs get in the way? If I understand the question, I wasn't, it's about how to develop the best it's, talent. Yeah, it's about how to develop the best talent um, and many other things can get in the way of those efforts. And so how do you how do you really develop the best talent? What is what are the most important aspects of doing that? What does the organization have to do? Well, I'm going to go to a general principle here. And I, if you want to, if those who want to read it uh, can do it, there's a Harvard Business Review article I wrote in uh, 2016, just a few years ago, uh, about what I call the great training lobby. So basically, the, while some training and development of leaders is necessary, it is not the primary, and I'm not the only one who's written about this, I just put together my own research with that of others, uh, is not the way to train leaders primarily. The way to train leaders and develop them is through doing, having them do things. Well, what does that mean? One is stretch assignments, where they're challenged. Uh, uh, Morgan McCall at the Center for, for Creative Leadership wrote a book long ago uh, about this, and uh, others have too. So this is a well-known, so putting leaders in different positions where they're challenged to lead. And by the way, what, what allows them to lead is that they have to stop relying on their technical competence, whatever it may be, and rely on the organization to help them move forward. So that's the learning that really goes on. Uh, the other is to ask people to go through a formal process like this as a leadership development experience and an organization change and development experience, which is powerful. So, for example, and I almost got thrown out of this for Beck, at Beckton Dickinson in the early years. I said, why don't you just ask every leader to do this and observe what they do? Are they willing to do it? Are they able to learn and improve their organization and their own leadership as a result? If they can't and won't, these are not leaders you want. If they can and will, yes, those are the people who will rise to the top, who will do a great job for you wherever they are. That's the, in, the fundamental lesson here of leadership development. So, for example, you could use this to have every leader taking charge of a new organization, and you know, people move around all the time, to go through this process to find out what the issues are in their organization. And, and now they're new leaders, so they're, 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 their past behavior is not in it. But once they go through it, repeat it, next time you learn about yourself because you're, in the, you're now in the organization. So there are many ways to develop leaders, either formally or informally, to learn by learning, by learning by doing the learning process. So Professor Beer, we're getting close to time, but I think I have time for one more question. Austin sure. Akarmati asks, which leadership behavior is more dangerous? Leaders who are too top down or leaders who are too hands off? 
either top down or what was the other? Hands off, laissez faire. Oh, is yeah. Oh, exactly. both so which which both is more dangerous, the leader that's too top down or too laissez faire? Uh, I, I, it's hard for me to pick one or the other because I think both are dangerous. But I guess if I had to pick one and I don't want to, I would say top down, at least in the laissez faire leader, leaders at lower levels have some uh, freedom to enact something creative. Now, whether that creative thing ever rises to do the company as a whole any good is a matter of, again, leaders who are willing to engage and to hear and to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I had to pick one, it would be top down. But, but laissez-faire is equally bad. Uh, you know, uh, it, do it doesn't really engage the organization in a continuous learning and improvement process. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you gotta have leaders who are willing to engage. That is the secret of effective leadership. Engagement, and of course that means what is that? And it's engagement in, in some dialogue about how we can do better. I don't care what, what it is, you know, it could be about, we've applied this to improving technology, uh, to an, uh, a, a, an IT department. We've applied it to a restaurant. We've applied it to a large corporations. We've applied it to business units, to functional department, to the um, uh, Asian region uh, of uh, Beckton Dickinson, for example. That was not too far. Uh, so all kinds of different applications for this because it's a fundamental ingredient. This is a fundamental of organization behavior and effectiveness. Thank you, Professor. And performance and trust. Yes. And uh, I'm sure Dean Quilch wants to wrap up. So I wanna thank everybody for submitting your questions. Um, I, I read the book, Fit to Compete. It has so many interesting and rich examples. So if, if Professor Beer did not get a chance to answer your question today, I would say, you know, definitely check out this book because, um, you know, it, again, especially uh, from a trust perspective, lays out some interesting, interesting dynamics. Um, Dean Qualtz, did you want to conclude by saying anything? Uh, thanks very much, Cecily. Thanks for uh, moderating the event. And uh, Mike, yes, it's great to, great to see you again. And, uh, uh, you know, clear from your presentation, the clarity of the presentation and uh, the thoughtfulness behind it, you know, thanks for a lifetime of scholarship devoted to this area on behalf of uh, all and uh, for the uh, wisdom that you've accumulated and uh, are able to share with, uh, with all of us and uh, many others. Uh, it's a real privilege to have uh, you with us tonight and uh, wish you many more years of uh, contribution to uh, the field of leadership. Thank you so much. Well, th thank you, John, again, uh, to the University of Miami for putting this on, I appreciate it. All right. Well, I wish uh, everybody a good night uh, now from Miami. Thank you for joining us.